Trophies. Big game trophies hold a special place in our hunting culture. Dating back to man's beginnings as a hunter-gatherer, the largest of a species has represented everything from the skill and bravery of the huntsman to a spiritual icon, to life-giving food and clothing. Over time, big game trophies have represented the wealth of a landowner's holdings, personal achievement, excellence in nature, memories, and family heirlooms. Hi, I'm Shane Mahoney. While times and cultures have changed, trophies are one aspect of hunting that has remained with us over the millennia and has grown in popularity. A good question to ask ourselves today is why? Why are trophies so revered and coveted? Why do we dream of large racks, invest in their existence, single them out of a herd, keep records, and display them long after the hunt is over? Entire wildlife economies have been built around the appeal of trophies. Why? Why do we score the antlers, horns, skulls, and tusks and rank them? We cannot pick up a magazine today, go to a sportsman show, watch a DVD, or even a television show, and not see trophies advertised as if they define what hunting is. Trophies, however, can be controversial, and in some cases, divide hunters. Has the notion of trophy gotten out of hand? Is selective hunting a good thing or a bad thing? As a career biologist, conservation advocate, and hunter, I often ask myself these same questions. As hunter conservationists, it is important we know the history behind trophies, their relevance today, and what trophies should and should not mean. We'll explore all aspects of the trophy next on Boone and Crockett Country. Boone and Crockett Country, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. The world's record stone sheep is considered by many to be North America's single greatest trophy. Ellis Chadwick took this unbelievable specimen while on expedition in British Columbia in 1936. Why is it that one animal that now lives only in pictures and in mounted form is so celebrated? Is it because his long, spiraling horns are so impressive? Is it because today, sheep are small in numbers and few have the opportunity to hunt them? Perhaps it is that this particular trophy, and how and when it was taken, stands as a testament to the once untouched and unspoiled wildernesses of North America. Or maybe it's because this one trophy represents our long fascination with the biggest and the best. And we fear that someday we will lose these great animals and the opportunity to hunt them. For some it might be that at a Boone and Crockett score of 196 and 68 points, no other ram of this species on record has even come close in size. Regardless of the reasons, hunters have always celebrated such great representatives of nature. It is not known exactly when the display of hunting trophies began, but we do know of its importance. Man's first art, applied to the walls of his cave dwellings, was not that of trees or rivers or sunsets. It was of the game animals he hunted, male animals with big horns and antlers. These early artisans demonstrated an appreciation for the largest of a species in early European cultures castles were adorned with trophies that represented a mastery over the land and the quality of the landowner's holdings, which included wildlife. Such displays of mounted antlers and pelts at one time served as a constant reminder of man's connection with nature and his dominion over our wild creatures, a dominion that would eventually be transformed into a conservation ethic. As North American sportsmen, we know that we lost much of our wildlife, especially big game, to over-harvesting for commercial markets, habitat loss, diseases, and irresponsible land use. The grave condition our large mammal species were in at the turn of the 20th century had many responsible sportsmen wondering if these great animals would be lost forever. Is it conceivable 
that an appreciation of big game trophies led to a big idea, like establishing the American system of conservation for the betterment of fish, wildlife, the habitats that support them, and the people? History shows this is exactly what happened. The earliest champions for conservation were sportsmen, big game enthusiasts, to be exact. Men like Theodore Roosevelt, George Bird Grinnell, and a handful of others that formed the nucleus of the Boone and Crockett Club, founded by Roosevelt in 1887. The club and its members worked diligently to establish and gain public support for the concept of conservation, enact laws and legislation, set aside land as sanctuaries for recovering wildlife populations, and raise funds to support the science of wildlife management. Our interest and fascination for trophies today can also be linked back to the actions of these same sportsmen. While devising a scoring and records keeping system for big game animals may not seem significant to conservation, big game records keeping played a major role in the recovery of our wildlife populations and remains to this day a very important part of our hunting culture. It is true, we don't commonly associate trophies or record books as having anything to do with conservation. It is perhaps that we are now three generations removed from the revolution led by North American sportsmen to save what was left of our dwindling wildlife populations. It is also possible that in today's world, we have elevated and commercialized the concept of trophy to a point where it now appears to be counter to conservation efforts. History has shown that wildlife having an economic value is a good thing. You will learn, however, that over-commercialization can be extraordinarily destructive to the wildlife we cherish. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Wild Sheep Foundation, putting and keeping sheep on the mountain, and the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. Wildlife, especially certain species of birds with ornate plumage, and the meat and hides from large mammals, once had commercial value, a value that led to the extinction of some species and the near extinction of numerous others. Sportsman-led efforts did away with commercial market hunting. With the passage of the Lacey Act in 1900, proposed to Congress by Boone and Crockett Club member Senator John F. Lacey of Iowa. This removed an open market value on public wildlife, paving the way for depleted populations to recover. At the same time, Theodore Roosevelt, chairman of the Boone and Crockett Club's first records committee, was in charge of developing a scoring and record keeping system for big game trophies. Given the perception of trophy hunting today, it might come as a surprise to you that the original foundation of the Boone and Crockett Club records was not about endorsement deals. Magazine covers are how to determine what fees to charge for taking of a trophy animal or a hunting lease. You have to understand that when the record book was first conceived, the extinction of many species of wildlife were a reality. Roosevelt and the Boone and Crockett Club were convinced that if recovery was going to happen, we were going to have to collect biological data to support this, as well as we were going to have to take some of the pressure off the breeding populations of these species. Large mammal record keeping began as a system that would accomplish three objectives in support of an emerging conservation movement. The first objective was to collect biological, harvest and location data on hunter-taken trophies. The existence of mature male specimens has been an indicator of population health both during the time we were trying to recover decimated big game populations and today when managing for sustainability. Since no such trophy data existed, it was believed that this information would be beneficial to game managers in setting policy and in tracking the success or failure of those policies. Trophy records were also used to recognize those sportsmen who participated in the conservation movement by selectively harvesting mature male animals who had already contributed their genes to the local game population. Removing pressure on the young and the females in a herd was paramount to recovery. By recording a trophy and recognizing the hunter in a book of records, 
sportsmen begin to see the benefits of game management and conserving for tomorrow. Finally, big game records offered proof that sportsmen were holding themselves to a high ethical standard. In the court of public opinion, sportsmen were wrongfully being lumped together with commercial market hunters who had no ethical standards because their living was about killing for quantity and efficiency. To further distance legitimate sportsmen from market hunters, an ethical code of conduct was instituted by sportsmen. The name, given to this code and endorsed by the Boone and Crockett Club, was Fair Chase. The Boone and Crockett Records Book held sportsmen to this high ethical standard by only accepting those trophies taken in Fair Chase. Following the new game laws and giving game a sporting chance became the rule, not the exception. This acceptance by sportsmen to respect the game, the land, and the privilege to hunt was perhaps the most significant outcome of the club's records keeping efforts. This new data collection system took many years to develop. In the meantime, the club was busy using trophies to draw sportsmen and the general public into the conservation movement. In 1922, the club opened its national collection of heads and horns at the Bronx Zoo in New York City. The first major trophy exhibit in North American history. The inscription over the entrance to this trophy exhibit was intentional. It read, in memory of the vanishing big game of the world. The intent was to wake up the public into realizing that all wildlife belonged to them, was in their care, but were being exploited. The public outcry resulting from this exhibit was so great that it reached the halls of Congress and subsequent legislation designed to protect wildlife and its habitat was given the attention it deserved. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Pope and Young Club for the Good of Bow Hunting and the Guide Outfitter Association of British Columbia. Wildlife stewardship is our priority. There's no denying the fact that records books published by the Boone and Crockett Club and Pope and Young Club have played a significant role in developing our fascination for trophies, historically and today. Boone and Crockett published the first book on the subject in 1906. This was followed in 1932 with the release of a more detailed and comprehensive book that included the club's first universal measuring system for native large mammal species, a system that was refined into the current system in 1950. The Pope and Young Club released the first book of just archery taken trophies in 1975. While a very small percentage of sportsmen will ever take a record book animal in their lifetime, trophies and records are a prominent part of our hunting culture. If you hunt large mammals, you're part of the system that protects these species, which is the underlying purpose of record books. And now, a closer look with Doug Painter, presented by Leupold, America's optics authority. Big game record books have been around for more than 80 years and have long been an important part of our hunting culture. Even if big game records aren't important to you, it's good to know their purpose and history. So let's circle back in time and revisit why we keep such records and what value they provide. Big game record keeping began as a way to document important information on these species, scientific data that helped to develop wildlife management programs to restore and then maintain animal populations. By emphasizing selective harvests, they fostered good wildlife management practices and in turn brought more sportsmen into the conservation movement. By insisting on fair chase, they helped develop a high standard of ethical conduct in the field. As big game populations recovered, record data became useful in tracking the success or failure of science-based restoration programs. 
Trophy ranking is based on the most common antler or horn configuration for the species. Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young record books also provide a list of those sportsmen who abide by fair chase and are involved in management and conservation activities. With conservation based on the wise use of our natural resources, and with hunting based on scientific management principles, the accuracy and integrity of big game records is critical. Truth is, any animal taken fairly by a hunter is a trophy and a measure of conservation success. The largest specimens are registered in the record books to help ensure successful wildlife management for our future generations. As you have learned, the interest in trophies can and has been a good thing and a vital part of the conservation and wildlife management landscape. But this same passion has really, I believe, in some cases, gotten away from us over the last decade or so. The notion of trophy is being held up as if it alone defines hunting. We're teaching young hunters through television and DVDs that going out and shooting a record rack every time out is to be expected. And if you don't, your hunt was not successful and you failed. That's a lot of unreasonable pressure to put on young people, especially at a time when we desperately need more young hunters as our next generation of conservationists. My concern is, as we move trophy ahead of everything else, the further we move it away from its original significance to conservation. And we must also be aware that non-hunters do not understand trophy hunting. In fact, many have a negative opinion of hunting in general based on misinformation about trophy hunting itself. And they are not alone. Many hunters feel the same way. Most people don't associate big game records with quality habitat, conservation, and game management efforts, but they should. That's what they really mean. Not endorsement deals or what to charge for a buck over 180. The question we should be asking ourselves is not what that deer scores, but how did he get there in the first place? And if I shoot him, how's he to be replaced next year? That's the true purpose of keeping and celebrating the big game records. Boone and Crockett Country has been brought to you by Leupold, America's Optics Authority, and the Boone and Crockett Club, fair chase and conservation since 1887. Actually, we'd been hunting, 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 hunting all those four days. And well, I mean, I saw, I mean, you know, he was gorgeous. I sh he was gorgeous, but I didn't have any thoughts of him, you know, being big enough to be in the record book. I, I still didn't have any thought until we got him back to fish and game to check him in after the hunt. And the fish and game guy, was, the warden was saying, you know, I think you better have this one measured took him to the taxidermist and our taxidermist said the same thing. So that was pretty exciting. Trophies, trophy hunting, scoring, and records books mean different things to different people. And this is how it should be. But the bigger picture here isn't bigger antlers. Today, fewer people hunt, yet many have a say in how wildlife is cared for and managed. If we as sportsmen do not understand the history and significance of trophies, how can we possibly expect non-hunters to understand? Hunters and non-hunters should see selective hunting as a pinnacle contribution to conservation, not as a self-indulgent or wasteful exercise, as some perceive it to be. Where trophy hunting is being incorrectly represented, more public education is needed. Why? We thankfully live in a time when the majority of citizens still accept hunting, as long as it is seen as fair, ethical, and in service to the environment. In a democratic society, those activities that stray off course or are seen to have outlived their usefulness risk being eliminated. 
If wildlife are to stay with us, if conservation and sound management are to continue, then public hunting must continue. But for this to happen, the public must still support the activity, even if they do not participate themselves. To maintain a majority approval rating, the public must see the value to wildlife that is derived from the advocacy and funding provided by hunters. For this to happen, sportsmen must step forward and tell our story. To do this effectively, we must know the facts surrounding all aspects of hunting, including the role of the trophy concept for the betterment of wildlife populations and their management. The good news is, hunting is conservation, and no one can take that away, and no one can take away the memories. That's what a trophy on the wall should and really does mean. Memories. I'm Shane Mahoney. Thank you for watching.